Where did God come from? Why is there evil? Where are we going? If you keep it simple, you actually hold everyone to a obje relatively objective standard. <clears throat> Once you start getting fancy, which I view as like an ultimate academic disease in the field of metaphysics, you enter another world of definition. What is reality? What is knowledge? What is anything? Why are we doing anything? And it leads basically you think you're ending up somewhere, but you end up going nowhere. But here's an interesting right. fact, which right. is that the Jewish studies study of Jewish thought has for that reason separated itself from what the philosophy department's called doing philosophy. And the reason for that is because I think of a feeling of sort of helplessness in light of the fact that you're not gonna get answers to these things, and therefore the so-called thought, by which I mean like when we say Jewish thought, right. Right, just becomes, well, what do I think? I can I have a lot of ideas, they're not necessarily disciplined. Hopefully most of them are right, so let me just say that. Right. And very often they're very inspiring and very good ideas. But that's what now poses for Jewish thought or philosophy because right. of the fact that ultimately it covers up the inability to answer questions besides this, this whole modernization process. Right. And I think right. after the Holocaust, it's especially true. Because either you have right. simplistic answers or you have people who admit. Like I always quote the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he says, said that we would never, ever have a way to understand the Holocaust. And, and, and you know, because no matter what explanation you're going to give, somebody's going to look at it. Listen, this suffering, you end your book with that story that I mean, how could anybody fathom, fathom any of this? And, and I think that that's another thing which has had a kind of nihilistic view in a certain sense of Jewish thought. It's just that, look, we, we have a choice, but we don't want. But I wanted to ask you a question, though, which is about definitions. Because I'm not sure if when you say the cause, that you mean the same thing that I would mean. What do you mean the cause? The cause. When you say, for example, that we want to know the cause of this or the cause of that, in a particular case, the cause of the of, 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 of God. I don't use the word cause at all. No, you use the word of the conversation here. Uh, you use no, the word cause. The origins. So, the, or, the origins. The what origins do you mean by the origin? The origins. Well, well, if you ask a seven-year-old, what would they say the word origins means? The beginnings of God. The, or the, 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 begin, the very beginnings of God. Okay, so here's the, 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 then you right. get into this problem, because if God is this potential. Right, right. So by, I hate to say this, but by definition, potential exists, right? right. Because it hasn't come into reality, but it exists right. in the world that's, well, that's why I say by okay. definition, okay. it's okay. eternal. So that, that therefore it exists and it's eternal. Right. So therefore you're back to the same simple fact that it has no cause if it's God. If God is that aspect, the core, right, which is, sounds very Kabbalistic, actually. I mean, we've talked about this before, and in fact, right. in the first volume, you trace all those sources. Right. Out, right, right. And allude again in the second volume. So right. this is not, right, right. But the point I'm making is that if you start with the idea that there's some kind of core thing, which is God, it also starts to come close to two other interesting No, I say the core thing, which I call the quest for potential. Right, but that's the core of what becomes, when you say becomes God, right. you're talking about the thing that we describe. In other words, right, you're right, not talking right, about right. God, because God's core remains what God is. It's Fair what enough. we, if we, if we see Fair that enough. God takes ahead of Egypt, we say God is a liberator. Fair we enough. see that God does this. Okay. We say, okay. okay. Now, Fine. then, so when you get finished, to some extent, you're back to the questions of the essence versus the attributes, and this is the essence, and everything else is the attributes. In which case, then you can't speak. It's not origin. It's the core thing which exists the whole time because it existed all the time. Fine. So therefore, okay, the question is. Which is a more elegant first proposition of metaphysics? If I pose to a thousand random seven-year-olds around the planet, is it more elegant to say that potential always existed, or is it more elegant to say the God of Israel always existed? And my, I would humbly submit, I would submit that most of the random seven-year-olds would say it's more elegant to say potential always existed, and therefore. Just like you call up a young kid to the Torah to see what the letter is, avoid the fancy players and the fancy discussion. Now, but now, you must remember that I write the Summa Metaphysica, which can be read, I'm very clear about it, more clear about it in the second book. You can view Summa Metaphysica through a religious lens or through a non religious lens. You can have Summa Metaphysica with a God or the God of Israel, <clears throat> or you can have Summa Metaphysica without the classic God of Israel. But however, in my schema, whether it's a religious perspective or a secular perspective, we are all part of an infinite divine. Now, this also is a, will rattle, will shake up the decks. But because that's where I head. Now, is this infinite divine the God of Israel or is it not the God of Israel? Well, I personally would tilt towards the God of Israel. But that's a personal opinion. That's not my academic position. 
My academic position is that you can take either approach. And either approach will basically work. And because I'm subjective, I grew up in a modern Orthodox home, it's hard for me to disentangle what part of it is my hardware, what part of it is my yeah, software. Yeah, yeah. Right. And um, therefore, the nice, the elegant part of it is it seems to work whether you approach it from a religious perspective or non-religious perspective. And as far as the God of Israel, exact origins, where crust potential starts, where the God of Israel finishes, that's room for a thousand, ten thousand sermons. You know, it's not, it, the Sulam Ethics does not rise or fall on where crust potential starts, where the God of Israel ends. It's, there's room to turn over, as we both know. I'm, I'm, as we all know, I'm dealing very rough brush strokes. But I feel they're elegant enough brush strokes to advance the equation. Now, yes, you know, I agree. But I would take it a step further. Not only, you see, it's true, Jewish philosophy, and probably regular philosophy, has basically given up. The problem is it doesn't say it's given up. It makes believe it has not given up. That's the real problem. More fun. It makes believe that we have a silly answer, and you silly 18-year-old or spoiled brat iPhone 22-year-olds just are not paying attention if we don't grasp it. The reality is they've given up. Now, I say, don't give up. I'm offering a, a unified metaphysics. It might be wrong. It might be right. But you know what? It looks like a unified, elegant metaphysics. I happen to think it's right, basically right. That's why I spent two decades tinkering with it. But you want to you say it's not right? Fine. But what are you counterposing it against? Where is, where is option B? I'm not aware of option B. I'm not aware of it in Yale. I'm not aware of it in Cheder. I'm not aware of option where option B is. Well, OK. The truth of the matter is if I started to after uh, a name, Actually, I don't have enough expertise to do this, correct? You have enough expertise. That's no, the point. No. You do have enough expertise. Not for what I'm about to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if I start to name diseases that are not being researched right now, right? That basically, things that are known that should be worked on. Yeah, watch how he shifts the discussion, ladies by and gentlemen. Medical, watch how, sh by watch medical, how he tries to shift the discussion. By medical research, <laughs> right? You would see that the same thing exists. It's not secretary, it's irrelevant. No, We're talking about philosophy. No, no, it's not irrelevant. It's right. a question. I, I think there are fundamental reasons right. for a, a lot of these, these factors, okay? One of the most fundamental is the rise of what some form of existentialism, which may or may not really be existentialism, that is they're leaving aside the technical definition of what it is, meaning religious approaches in which what is key is my experience. Once my experience becomes key, I can say, look, I don't really know exactly why it works this way, but I don't need to know. And since I see that all these people who tried to write at either wrote stuff I couldn't understand, or didn't get tenure, or, right, not that many people seem to be interested, I say, look, I don't care about this. My minister or something, right, sitting in, you know, the fourth Baptist church or so ever, right, he said to me, listen, what you need to do is, you need to be able to nurture yourself in a relationship with the divine. Now, here's a really interesting fact. I once heard a fantastic lecture from uh, Dr. Norman Lamb about this. It was on the back of your first book. So, and he, he said that there's a part of me which I cannot and will not reveal to you. And there's even a part of me that I reveal to nobody, not even to my, to my, to my family, okay? Now, the point is that that part of you that you would never reveal is the part of you that in the religious system is somehow supposed to be in some relation with God, which is not defined by outward ritual acts. It's not defined by that guy sitting in the pew or the Jew putting on uh, tefillin or something like that. It's some very inner thing. Now, because you don't need to answer these questions, people say, look, just put this aside. We can't answer these questions. Let's just have our experience. And that will edify us in a genuine way, make us better people, make us understand our place in the world. And whereas, if I'm going to sit around all day discussing, you know, all these issues, see, I, I happen to believe, by the way, that many Jews who survived the Holocaust to populated synagogues that we go to, modern Orthodox synagogues, came away not really believing in any of the uh, things that they should believe in. In fact, I think we want to discuss this, that those people really should read this book. Right? because the book makes it possible to have a system of theology in which you don't have to solve this problem of evil in the Holocaust, or it's essentially solved because humans have to have freedom. Now, 
course, that doesn't satisfy the person who literally experienced it. No matter what you say, it doesn't satisfy. For good reason, we can't judge this. But anyhow, the point that I'm making is, I've always had the feeling that a lot of these people have come to the conclusion, you know, I don't have any answers, I don't really believe this, but I just know this is the right way to live. And that, I think, on some level is true about some of these questions of why they've been abandoned. Okay. For quick, 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 quick response. Yes, I believe that's, cor that's correct, that basically Jewish philosophy has evolved into Jewish homiletics. Instead of your philosophy, I'm going to give you. A, I'll give you a speech and for the that's public. What people want, right? So, but the fact, the fact that that's what people want, that fact that we're getting, doesn't mean that it's metaphysics. It's not metaphysics. No, it's not. And it's not philosophy. It's homiletics. It's right. a speech, and and it's a rabbinic speech or a, a, cler a cler clerical speech. As far as the Holocaust survivors, you know, I gave a Yom Hashoah address at Oheb Tzedek, 95th Street on the Upper West Side, Manhattan. And in the front two rows, there were two rows of survivors of Bergen Belsen. And I will tell you, I was, I was very tense giving my, giving my speech. Because I myself did not know how this would go off. I know if they'd be angry at me, they'd come over and slap my face afterwards. I did not know. And to my, I was sh to my shock, they came over me and hugged me. Why is that? Well, my, interestingly enough, the work, which seems so, um, which seems so unemotional, on some level, gives meaning to their lives. Because according to this work, the possibility for evil, twinned with the possibility for good, on some level ignites creation. And that if there were no Holocaust, or things like as terrible as a Holocaust, there could have been no creation. So on some level, although and some of it was a death-defying tightrope walk, the Holocaust, the possibility of a Holocaust ignites creation. And on some level, this terrible suffering, none of us want to go anywhere near that suffering individually. On some level, their suffering ignites creation retroactively. And this is the best we can do. But it turns out the best we can do was sufficient for this particular group. And again, to my shock, to my shock, they were crying and I was crying. And from there crying, you know. So that was a small sample, but it was reality. Um, Okay, let me turn the table over, over to yourself now. Uh, well, I just had one, uh, there was another kind of insight, or let's say more, more comment, that, uh, that struck me. Um, and that was that really, there's a really deep sense in which I see your work as a kind of culmination or outcome of the Enlightenment, but especially in the context of an American context. There's something deeply American about <laughs> this metaphysics, which fair is enough. interesting. Fair enough, fair right. enough, and fair and enough. Um, you know, we know the joke, American movies have happy endings, European movies have sad endings. Right. 